are live! But yes, we're also on tape, like we always are. Beautiful and smoky downtown Kamloops. We're in Lee's Music, State of the Art, Studio 2. Chris Folds, Marty Hastings, Magic Mike, Bonnie, and our first ever live audience guest, Mike's niece, Kessa, is with us. Uh, so from hello from there, Kelowna. Kessa, from Kelowna. That's right. Uh, Chris, I actually wanted to start with your name. Um, you go by Chris all the time when I talk to you, but I wrote an article and yesterday I wrote your name and you edited it back to Christopher yes. in the newspaper. So why do you do that? Well, just professionally, and that's my name. That's my given name. Christopher is a, is a great name. I think my mom did well in naming <laughs> me like that. Um, it's, it's a nice name. It's a great name. If, you know, if I was Melvin, I might go with Mel, but I like Christopher. A little, and, uh, a little pretentious, though, a little bit? Like it's, it's what I was named. <laughs> Mike Riley, the, the, the quarterback of the BC Lions, this year has asked everyone to call him Michael Riley in honor of his mom who died in the offseason, and, and she, she, she called him Michael, and he's asked people to honor that by calling him Michael. I call you Martin sometimes. Yeah, not everything comes back to the Lions. Every <laughs> single time it's back to the Lions. My real name is actually William Robert Martin Hastings. Talk about too. pretentious. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, <laughs> Ross Hastings, my father. Yeah. Um, you're Foldsy from Abbotsford, in my mind, and I went to your old stomping grounds for this commercial we're about to see from our sponsor. None of this happens without New Leaf Produce Market. I went to Abbotsford to check out Newfeld Farms. It's a source farm for um, New Leaf. Check the commercial out right now. Eyes on the camera. Okay, buddy? Let's go. Marty Hastings here outside New Leaf Produce Market with my new best Herman. Look at the camera, pal. Stay on your feet. Herman is paying us to do this commercial, but he said this. He said, Marty, on one condition. I do not want to be in the commercial. And I said, Herman, that is complete and total hogwash. You will be in the commercial because I won't let him be sheepish. Not when all of his produce is edible art and not when it's a hyper-local labor of love from his family farm, Hefley Farms. And not when he sources seasonal product from more than 40 of the best regional suppliers like Newfeld Farms in Abbotsford, British Columbia. I had to see it for myself. Nothing like a good road trip. In you get, Herman. Yeah, but let's go! Get me some sour keys, pal. No peeking, Herman. Help my goodness, Steve. Are these strawberries ever good? You're quiet today, Herman. Want some corn? Have a bite, Herm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and yes, it's true. A lot of people have asked me. They say, Marty, is he awkward on camera? I say, you're darn right he is. But this is a quality man who deals only in quality produce, and he has to be seen. Right, Herm? Okay, bud, last chance to make the catch. Let's go. Embarrassing. You're gonna hurt Herman. Folds, you saw the commercial, you saw Herman. What do you think about him as, as a road trip buddy? I think. Herman is quite loquacious. He should really shouldn't talk so much because I could barely hear you. Uh, the second thing is is uh, is when you showed up in, in Abbotsford, Abbey Rules. I could smell the money from growing up there. You know what I mean? I could smell Abbotsford, and uh, it was very uh, took me back a long time. And and Herman must have been a great road buddy. You could probably smell the money from all the B and E's you used to do out there as a youth. Um, <laughs> actually, we have some stuff here, and we're going to give it away. Uh, we have sweet Walla Walla onions, cherries, bunched beets, carrots. Zucchini, patty pan squash, apricots, rainier cherries, and Hefley white potatoes. You can win this haul. What you have to do, email klwatcantaloupsthisweek.com and share the link of this episode on Facebook. Also subscribe to us on Kamloops Last Week on YouTube and you will have this haul for yourself. 
if Herman knew it was good for him, I think he'd go up to Hillside Stadium right now and park outside the Lions because those boys like to eat. And we got to meet one of them, uh, one of your favorite players, I think, Brian Burnham. What do you think about Brian Burnham? Brian Burnham is uh, undoubtedly the best receiver in, in, in the <laughs> CFL. He's probably the best receiver in North America right now, and he probably chooses to, to play in the CFL. He could burn up the NFL. He is that good. Let's meet him in the next segment, which is called the Tattle of Hastings. Foldsy, what's your all-time number one uh, best Lions receiver in your mind? Well, until Burnham came came here, it would have been uh, Swervin Mervin or Jim Young back in the day. But uh, but since then, he's been here seven years. He is my favorite Lion, not just because he is an amazing pass catcher and he has circus catches you know, left, right, and center. But he just seems like a g decent, genuine guy. Right, and that's why we chose him for this interview, because he's a thoughtful human being. And let's check that interview out right now. What's it like to finally be back in Kamloops and what's it like to be dealing with the smoke out there? Oh man, it's, it's, it didn't seem real at first. It was, it was really cool um, driving back up here. Um, but yeah, it was kind of eerie because it's just driving through the smoke and uh, it's just pretty, it's pretty bad out there. Um, I guess this isn't new for, for people in Kamloops, but uh you know, used to being here in, in May and uh, early June. So uh, July, it's definitely, it's definitely a little different, but it's, it's great to be back. Have you noticed any effects after practicing in it for a few hours? Um, actually, you know, it hasn't been too bad. Um, last night we practiced later. Uh, we started at 7. And, uh, you know, once that sun started to go down, it really cooled off a lot and didn't really notice the smoke too much. This is your first real taste of life under Rick Campbell. Devon Claybrooks was running the show last time out. What are some of the main differences you're noticing in, in uh, their styles of running training camp? Um, you know, it's a little bit different. Um, you know, Rick is, he's a guy who wants things run really fast and, and really smooth, but um, he's not going to run you into the ground. He's going to, he's going to give you, breaks and, and let your legs rest and and uh, things like that and you know Clay Brooks was a good guy but um you know there's a lot of extra stuff conditioning running after practice all that good stuff and and you know Campbell's more of a guy who you know that sh that should be done during practice as you're running your plays and and all that stuff and then when you're done you're done and uh, it's been good so far. Really, that's interesting because I think the outside perspective was it was the other way around, that things might be a bit more relaxed uh, uh, around Devon. Like I said, I, you know, I, I liked Clay Brooks, but there's definitely more conditioning and, and, you know, practice was a little harder. And, you know, I mean, it's only been two days under uh, Rick, so I guess the jury's still out on that. But uh, so far, it's been really good. You know, you just, you know, you get in, you get out, do what you need to do and get off your feet. Your father, Lem, is a multi-accomplished guy. He's a decorated Vietnam War veteran. He's, uh, he played in the NFL and uh, won one game in the CFL, and, um, and he's, a, he's a doctor. He's a psychologist now. With the mental aspect of a, of a pro sport, how has that helped you, and can you take that and kind of teach your teammates and others what you've learned from your dad from the mental side? Well, yeah, it's been huge um, you know, ever since you know, I started playing football at 12 years old. He always really – really drilled the mental side of the game. Um, he knew the physical side would come, you know, you work out, you, you train, you practice, um, you know, you work hard, but um, the mental aspect is a side that a lot of people take for granted and don't focus on. And uh, it was really good to have that in my corner and kind of have that advantage of, of having a professional, um, I'm not just a professional football player, but a professional psychologist and, and a guy who really knows what it takes mentally. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something that I, that I haven't really um, talked to teammates about. Uh, not too much. Talked to a few guys here and there, but definitely something I should uh, kind of start to um, bring to my teammates for sure. All right. Now you, um, you went to Tulsa. Uh, do you live there now? I do. My wife and, and I went to our house uh, a couple months ago. And you, you were a history major, correct? Yes. That's so, great. 
So before the, the, the protests and the George Floyd death and, and, and how that brought it out, out into the light, did you know about the Tulsa massacre? And what kind of memorials are there in Tulsa that we might not know about? Yeah, I, uh, I learned about the Tulsa race riots actually right when I got to Tulsa and started taking history classes there. And um, yeah, it was uh, a rough history. And uh, I think something that they kind of tried to bury and forget about. And uh, but obviously it came to light again uh, this past year in 2020. And um, there's, there's some memorials and things like that um, in that area of Tulsa, the Greenwood district, but in terms of, in Tulsa downtown and stuff, there's not too much. And, uh, you know, I'd like to see that change. Brian, I know you're a, an astronomy uh, uh, aficionado of some kind, and uh, you actually share a birthday with uh, Michael Neander, who's a well-known or sort of well-known German astronomer from the 1500s, just so you know, April 3rd. Both of you. <laughs> uh, Neander has a crater on the moon named after him. So if you were, have the honor of having any kind of geographical feature uh, on, uh, on any planet named after you, which planet would it be? Oh, man. <laughs> well, other than Earth. Um, <laughs> uh, Mars would be pretty cool. Yeah. We'll explore Mars more and more, so that'd be pretty cool. And what do you enjoy about it? I've just always been, I mean, you know, the sun goes down, you just look up at night and the stars and, you know, there's just so many questions out there um, that I've just always really enjoyed. And, you know, it started back in middle school for me with my, with my science teacher. And it's just always been something that's really, really intrigued me. And it's just really cool. It doesn't take much to study it. You know, you just go out and you look up at the sky. Yeah, I just want to know, I know uh, you're a big fan of The Wire. I think it's the greatest TV show, one of them of all time. So uh, for, for those who've never seen it, why, why is it such a good show? That's a great question. <laughs> I wish we had more time to talk about it. Maybe we will have to set something up to talk more later, but just about man, the wire, yeah. it, it just really goes into a lot of depth about each each character and, and their lives and, and the type of people they are and why they do what they do. And it's just really, really good show. It is. People should watch it for sure. Definitely. Right. Brian, well, maybe you can make like Omar this year and be a killer on the field. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate your time, man. Take Great. Care. Hey, thanks, guys. All right, Chris, you really dug deep with some of those questions. Michael Neander, how did you come up with that one? Well, I just, I just know that, uh, that, uh, that Brian Burnham likes astronomy, so I was just checking out some astronomers. I remember Michael Neander as one of the guys who had his uh, a crater on the moon named after him. It just so happens that he has the same birthday as Burnham, so it worked out well for the, for the, for the episode. Now, what did you think about his comments about uh, Rick Campbell and Devon Claybrooks? I was surprised, as you, as, as you were. I thought, we thought that under, uh, under, under Claybrooks, it was a more laissez-faire and... Uh, and loose uh, practice schedule. Like he said, it's only been a few days into the training camp, but I was surprised at, at that it might be the opposite of what we think of Claybrooks as a coach. Training camp going on right now. I did contact Jeff Putnam last night from the city to find out uh, if there's going to be an extension. I think there's, they're planning to have an extension. He, in classic Jeff Putnam fashion with a lot of exclamation part points, told me that uh, not yet, but they're, they're working on it. He probably has the best uh, answering machine in all the city of Kamloops. He's probably trying to get them to go to Tobiano. One of his secret hikes, he doesn't tell anybody about it. Oh, you can't. <laughs> Look at my big hike. I'm not going to tell you where it is. Um, <laughs> anyway, we're going to talk more about the fires now, which uh, have been kind of plaguing camp in the next segment, which is called Above the Folds. All right, Chris, there's a ton to talk about. This photo was taken by our photographer, Ali D. Alan Douglas. Uh, this was Juniper. Where do you want to start? Well, I mean, it just, it's, it's uh, as we're taping this on, um, on July 14th, it's just getting worse and worse. There's fires everywhere. There's smoke everywhere. Um, it reminds us of 2017, 2018. I thought with 19 and 20, we got a respite and we thought, well, maybe that was just an anomaly, but it seems like this is gonna be the thing every couple of years or more. Uh, on Friday, a, couple, uh, a few days ago, Jessica Wallace from the paper and I joined a media tour of Lytton and we saw the devastation, the fire there wrought. Now, it wasn't a wildfire per se, but it was a fire that spread because of the heat. What was it like to actually be there? It was, it was incredible. You know, you see uh, Fort McMurray, you see the, uh, often the towns raised in Northern California and you see it on TV. It's, it's, it's not much different than that when you see it in person. What's different is the smell, the taste, the act 
acrid taste. But the biggest thing is what remains, the color. You know, there's 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 no rhyme or reason. There's a, there's a there's a slew of raised buildings. It's all gray and black and, and ash. And then there'll be a, a for no no reason a, a nice white house sitting there or a rainbow crosswalk, or a, you know a colorful chair sitting in the middle of all the rubble. Almost like Schindler's, Schindler's List when you have that one the one uh, colorful jacket or or the Wizard of Oz when you go from black and white to color. That's what stood out is, is what survived and why. Mm -hmm. What's the latest uh, with the fires around this area? Okay, so as, as of July 14th, we have the uh, Sparks Lake fire just northwest of the city that's now, it was burning southeast, so toward Frederick, Frederick across from Tobiano, which is not a good thing, but the winds today are supposed to push it the other way. We have the uh, Embleton Mountain wildfire near, near Sun Peaks and, and uh, and Whitecroft, uh, that's good news there is a last report, it was burning upslope away from the community. And we have the um, um, Durand uh, Lake fire out by um, Cherry Creek. And so far so good, there, it, it's not growing, but it's still out of control. There's, there's been a lot of uproar from a lot of people about response from the government in, in a lot of areas of the province. And I got a message from an old rugby buddy of mine, I rate that, that he was having to fight this fire essentially in the Dead Man Valley by himself, trying to save his ranch by himself. And his brother posted this big, uh, long rant uh, about how we're so concerned about these fires within city limits and Juniper got all this attention. But what about these ranches and these ranchers who are, their livelihoods are at stake and they're not getting enough exposure? Yeah, we've heard the same thing. We've talked to, we we're talking to a few people this week about that. And uh, I have seen the BC Wildlife Service say, you know, they're, they're stretched thin. They, they, they can't get to every uh, the problem a lot of times up in uh, Red Lake and the Deadman Valley is some people don't even don't have, never mind, they're not on a Facebook to see the alerts or Twitter, they don't have internet connections. So it's hard to get to them to say, hey, get out or Here, here's what we do. As for like fighting the fires and bringing them, uh, bringing them help, um, it all depends, I guess, on how much, how much, how many crews they have. There's fires everywhere right now, but I guess everybody is in the same boat. What are we going to do for coverage this week? What do you have Wallace on? What do you have uh, Golden T, Michael Patesio? What about uh, the chandelier, Sean Brady shining his light? What's he going to do the this week? The chandelier's on vacation. He's oh. actually He actually traveled to the Kootenays and stopped en route to get his second shot, so that's good. Yeah. Um, uh, but we are looking into other stories. We're Obviously, we're keeping up on the fires on online at canvasthisweek.com. But the other angle right now, we were just talking to it with Magic Mike Miltimore. Where do people go? Every single hotel and motel room in Kamloops apparently is booked solid yeah. uh, with evacuees and with vacationers. Uh, so uh, the uh, MacArthur Island Evacuation Center run by the TNRD is full with Lytton and other wildfire fire, uh, evacuees. Right now when there's an evacuation order, the first thing the TNRD tells people is try to find room with family and friends because there's no room here. If you can't do that, they have to go to Salmon Arm right now where they have a prestige resort they're opening up. I think the city, and we're working on this story as we speak right now at back of the newsroom, the city's going to have to look at opening up Salmon Center, maybe Memorial Arena and other places like they did in 1718 because this is not going to get, it's going to get much worse before it gets better with respect to evacuation orders. Are these the end times or what? We've got fires, friggin' plagues, tyrant leaders, is this it? Like, I'm up all night thinking the same thing. I'm not kidding. I'm thinking this, this could be the, the you know, they, they call it the next extinction era. And, uh, you know, not maybe right now, but I think it's going to be, uh, I don't know, I, I, look, I have a bleak outlook for the future, I really do, with everything we got. I do. I mean, I'm try, I got two kids and they're 19 and 20, and I, I, and I fear for their future, I really do. I have a stepdaughter who's 10. But I think, you know, all you can do is what you can do. Here, here's what really pisses me off, is we have a uh, question of the week in the paper saying, in light of the record heat, the second driest spring ever recorded since 1891 when records started being recorded, you know, what, what are you going to do to try to do your part or, or to change your habits for climate change? Climate change is reality. It's not, it's not a theory. It's, 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 there's no debate. I think the second most popular response that I threw it in there was, I'm not sure if it's linked. People still, people still don't think this is linked, despite all the experts saying it is, people who devote their lives to this uh, study. And we still have a lot of people saying, I don't know if it's linked. And, and we're never going to get out of this. Mm -hmm. Never. Well, you can't cure stupid. And you need to stop responding to these people on Facebook at 1 in the morning after a couple of glasses of red <laughs> wine. And these friggin' your classic Foldsy keyboard starts going. Because you're, you're not going to change their mind. Know, you're not going to change these idiots' minds. That's just it, the way it is. I know. I know it. And, I, and I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> but I just, like you say, you look outside and you can't see across the street. You know, you try to do your, your thing, and, uh, and I, get the, I get the people who say, well, I can't you know, you can't afford the carbon tax. Gas is 152. I can't afford an electric car. I get it. There's so many variables to this. It's very hard. Even what about uh, more smaller issues than, than life and death, but, you know, property values and people not wanting to live here anymore because the summers are going to, if the summers are two months of the year, smoke, like, yeah. 
I don't. I wouldn't want to live here all the time. Maybe. <laughs> well, there, there's many. There's many. There's many. Uh, you know, sort of uh, secondary aspects to this thing. I mean, Brian Burnham in his in his interview said, "What about could, the Lions? Yeah, Do they the think Lions. twice about staying?" Well, yeah. He's, you know, he says May is okay, but you know, may, maybe maybe it extends there. But yeah, this obviously has an impact on a lot of things uh, with respect to people locating here for various reasons. Okay. Our next guest. Does he think we're in the end times? He's the mayor of Kamloops, Ken Christian. Let's meet him in our next segment. Uh, last week. This week. <laughs> Before we bring in our mayor, who is a basketball guy, you and I made a bet a month ago or so about Kelly Olenek, about uh, will he play for Canada at the Olympics. Um, I said he would, you said he wouldn't. He kind of it looked like he was going to. He was, on, he was on the roster to begin with, yeah. Right, and then he, he took himself off the roster and he didn't play in the qualifying tournament. So I think officially I lost that bet. And I can thank Kelly O for having a, a, a pint and wings on you whenever that may be. Although I could say, we don't know if he would have played in the Olympics because what if he was just mitigating risk and Canada qualified for the Olympics and then he wouldn't join the team and, and then I would have won the bet. So, well, yeah. Typical South Surrey <laughs> edging out of it, that's fine. Um, actually, let's lay out that situation. We're gonna ask Ken about Kelly. So I don't wanna sit up here and, and take shots at Kelly Olenek, but I will, lay out the fact that he will be receiving some criticism. Sure. He um, didn't play essentially because he's out of contract in the NBA and his next contract is going to likely be worth tens of millions of dollars. Probably his he, biggest one. Let's just say 10 million a year, mm -hmm. three, four years, something, I'm not an expert in that area, but something like that. Anyway, if he went and played for Canada and got hurt, that could be all off the table. So it's hard to fault a man for thinking about his family, for generationally thinking about his family and money. Now the other side is he already has made tens of <laughs> millions million of a year dollars. in his last contract. That's right. right. And yeah. he and you, you can't fault his history of playing for Canada because he's been one of the stalwarts. Mm -hmm. But will he regret this decision? Does he deserve criticism for not taking that risk? Canada didn't qualify. They went to that tournament. They lost in the semifinal to the Czech Republic yep. by two points. Yep. If Kelly Olynyk's there, does he put him over the edge and help his country to the Olympics? So what do you think about that whole situation? Well, I think the question always goes back to this question. What would Stevie Nash do? The greatest Canadian basketball player of all time. Now, I think he's, he's played a lot, but if he was he was in the same situation, would he want to preserve, you know, for the injury's sake? Kelly mentioned that in your interview with him. He make, made that clear, saying he'd love to do it, but he has to think about the free agency, the, the risk injury, and the impact that would have. And this, that's why I didn't think he was going to do it. Not because I think he's, he's, he's unpatriotic. I think he's pragmatic. Right. Let's ask our mayor about that, and then we'll talk to him about the fires. Let's welcome him in right now, Mayor Ken Christian. Well, we were just talking about Kelly Olenek and uh, how he opted not to play for Canada. Canada didn't end up getting the Olympics. What do you make of his decision not to play? Uh, you know, I, I know Kelly, I know his family, and I know that would have been a very difficult decision for him to make. But, uh, you know, he's in a contract year and, and uh, heading into free agency. And, uh, you know, this is a $50 million plus decision in terms of him getting hurt. Uh, and, you know, when I reflect on the last game, we really could have used him, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the fact that uh, he's made that decision, I respect. Right. It's tough to throw stones because neither you nor Chris nor I know what it's like to have $50 million on the table. So uh, it is tough to throw stones. Anyway, let's switch gears. Let's talk about uh, the fires. Uh, Chris, why don't you lead with some questions? Yeah, Kim, it's been well documented, well reported, well, well discussed at council about the uh, well the fires in general, but the uh, the Juniper Valley View fire in in particular, and and uh, and and the great work the the fire department and, and the crews from the BC Wildfire Service and, and and Mother Nature with that well timed rain, but there's also been a lot of criticism or questions about communication, egress, all that kind of stuff. So, why don't we start with tell 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 us, remind us what went well and what needs work. Well, you know, uh, <laughs> what went well, obviously, is the suppression efforts. I mean, there was no loss of life. There was no loss of structure. Uh, but there was uh, confusion and chaos in terms of the evacuation. So communications is an issue there. Uh, and uh, also the issue related to egress out of Juniper Ridge uh, is another one. And then in the longer term, uh, this whole notion of uh, the interface neighborhoods that we have in the community and, and how we approach those, 
Uh, and, you know, face it, we're, we're looking at uh, a year that's uh, virtually unprecedented in my 40 years in Kamloops in terms of weather conditions and drought and things like that. So it all combines together to make a, a, a very dangerous situation, not only in Valley View and Juniper Ridge, but in a lot of other uh, neighborhoods, uh, you know, certainly Rose Hill and and uh, the areas off of the Peterson Creek uh, Nature Park and Dufferin and Pine View and, and even out to Rayleigh, you know, for, for train uh, caused incidents. Yeah. So we have to be on high alert. You were you live in Juniper. You were part of the evacu evacuated. Did you you must have had different contact with the city, but can you just briefly describe what it was like to leave there and, 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 and what was going through your mind? Well, <laughs> and did you have you know, a go bag? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm guilty. I did not have a go bag and I, I wasted time uh, wondering what I was going to put in my go bag. Uh, but it was it was frightening. Uh, you know, that's I've lived up in, in uh, Juniper, Juniper for pretty much all the time I've been in Campbell, so, uh, certainly over 35 years. And it's the third house I've had up there. There's been four times that that road has been an issue. Uh, this is my second fire. We had one on Balakula Court about 30 years ago. And then uh, we've had a couple of very serious accidents that have blocked that road for significant periods of time. And uh, at one time, I remember specifically missing a flight because I was caught up there. So, I mean, that's a reality uh, of, uh, you know, that uh, neighborhood and uh, reality that we've known about for a long time. And as the neighborhood developed, the plan has always been to have a second uh, exit out of Juniper. Uh, it will connect onto Rose Hill Road and then connect with Valley View Drive down by Fire Hall 3. So that's always been at the works. I think uh, what happened on uh, July 1st, quite frankly, you're right, we got very lucky. Uh, and I think that should be a sentinel event for us uh, as a community to recognize that we need to expedite that work. Uh, and the city staff have already done that in terms of uh, uh, the emergency uh, exit piece, but uh, the, the, the more permanent connection is a bit bigger of an engineering challenge. And that's also that that permanent connection, uh, which you want to expedite, like you say, you don't want it to be a 10 year plan, you want it to be a, a, a soon as we can plan. The private property is taken care of with development, but we have crown land, correct, to, to deal with? Yeah, that's that's correct. So there's uh, uh, Juniper West Developments uh, just completing that galore uh, subdivision. And as they complete that and it meets city standards, that will be turned over to the city. So that's the last piece of private land we have. Then we go into, it's about a kilometer left, it goes through that site that has been earmarked for a school. Uh, and so there's uh, Crown Grant land there and uh, the school site, we, we need to know where that's likely to be located so we don't have a road through the middle of a school. Right. And then we have the Fortis right of way there. And then there's a small piece of Crown land as well. So uh, we spoke with uh, the uh, uh, Flynn Row people, the Forest Lands Natural Resource Management and Rural Development people uh, last week about expediting those right of ways. Uh, and we've also gotten in there. Uh, I think today we're actually working on the upper one, the cold water one. Uh, and we're going to uh, be focusing then on the, the lower one, which is actually in better shape. I, I walk out in that area quite often. I did so about two months ago and, and uh, it was certainly passable, but not a road that you would want to take, uh, you know, the trailer and the boat yeah. and the kids and everything else on. Uh, it is exactly what it's billed as, as an emergency exit. And there's a reason that you want to keep it that way because, uh, you know, you could wind up if you open it up uh, to creating more hazards than you're solving. Uh, you know, it could become uh, the place for the grab parties. Right. It could become the place for uh, people to have uh, accidents out in that area. And it, it is undeveloped. So we want to uh, make sure that we get the alignment right so that the money we are using on the emergency exit will be on the same alignment as the permanent road. Uh, and then we have, you know, some other issues. And, and uh one is how do we connect to Rose Hill Road? Uh, you know, uh, there's traffic there, uh, obviously, and, and whether or not you'd have a roundabout there. Uh, and if you have a roundabout, that generally has to be at a level spot. Mm -hmm. uh, where it connects right now is not a good spot. It's on a corner, and uh, it's it's uh, in a sand belt. 
then you have Rose Hill Road itself, which is really not designed for the increased traffic that you would see. There's no real uh, shoulders and things like that. So that would have to be improved. And then when you get down the bottom of the hill, uh, you have that interface with uh, Valley View Drive. And does that create another roundabout? And if so, does that involve expropriation of property and things like that? So, I mean, these are decisions that the city is actively working on and, and not just since the fire. They have been working and alive to these issues for a long time, but uh, they are certainly expedited now. And like you just mentioned, and it's a good explanation, it's not just the, the road, it's everything that comes after and before it. So um, uh, one, one other thing I wanted to mention to you is, um, is uh, you were on vacation during the fire, right? Yes. And you were in, in town. You've yes. seen you've seen some criticism about how you weren't vocal or you weren't on Twitter or you weren't speaking to the people. I know the city was, but they were delayed in the communications. What do you take from that? And there was some criticism. Yeah, and and uh, fair enough. I mean, I haven't had a vacation in eighteen months, so yeah. it had been my intention to go and see my new grandson. But uh, I was uh, at home on the first and uh, was evacuated and uh, stayed around. Uh, to kind of uh, deal with a lot of that angst and anxiety. And I get that, you know, people were frightened. And, and uh, when you're frightened, you're going to lash out. And I'm the mayor, I'm the yeah. CEO, and I'm the guy that's going to get that. But referring back to Marty's question, you know, I'm also a 30-year basketball referee, so I can take that kind <laughs> of stuff. But, you know, um, you know it, it, it's frustrating for people and and uh, you know they're looking for you know someone and and very often the city and city council are the closest people so we're going to get the wrath but to the extent that we uh, can do what we can we can't be responsible for lightning and, and those kinds of things so uh, i get it uh, that uh, people were frustrated uh, i get it that uh, there wasn't a presence from the mayor but we do have a deputy mayor rotation and uh, Councillor Singh did an admirable job in terms of uh, being the deputy mayor, and uh, that's the way the system works, and we always have someone on duty. Uh, I signed off to him uh, late in the evening on the 30th, uh, actually, just to take a, a few weeks off, so uh, uh, that was uh, the case, and uh, it will be again at another time. Hopefully nothing else happens. Though. Right. Well, Ken, I, I do blame you for the lightning, by the way, but other than that, um, you didn't sign up for end times when you signed up to be mayor, I don't think. You got the pandemic, uh, and now you've got these fires. What's it been like uh, dealing with that? How is your stress level uh, doing? <laughs> you know, I was talking to someone about that the other day. I mean, it's it's just been a series of, of uh, things, the, the pandemic being the biggest one. And, uh, you know, with the snowbirds crash, uh, you right. know, even, even things like, uh, you know, the loss of my friend Donnie Moore's uh, last mm -hmm. week. So... Those kinds of things weigh heavy on everyone, but when you're the mayor, uh, heavy is the head that wears the crown. And, uh, you know, you sign up for these things uh, and you uh, play the cards you're dealt. Uh, fortunately for me, my background is in public health and I have uh, know my way around an emergency operations center through my professional life. So uh, a lot of this is not new to me, but, uh, you know, council have been, uh, you know, very engaged, very active on all of these fronts uh, and, and looking through all of the dark clouds. And, and I include in that list the uh, situation with the Tecumlips Teshkwetan and the notoriety that Kamloops and region have uh, sort of had through that. Uh, council have been very focused. You know, they've been focused on relationships. They've been focused on a lot of the indicators that we have in the community, uh, uh, climate change and, and those kinds of things. So, you know, we are progressing as a city and part of that progression uh, is change. And, and I think that's what resonates with a lot of people in terms of issues like the opioid crisis and the homelessness and those kinds of things that uh, these are, you know, what hitherto for we thought were big city problems that were only in Vancouver. Uh, but quite frankly, uh, cities of our size uh, and even smaller uh, are faced with a lot of these urban challenges now. Now you mentioned uh, heavy is the head that wears the crown and you signed up for this as mayor. We know that Arjun would dearly love to see the deputy dropped off and become mayor <laughs> next time. And we know he's angling. I think Dieter Duty's in the shadows. He's also plotting something. So tell us now, give us the scoop. Are you going to seek re-election in October 2022? So, uh, you know, for a, a federal election, I think you need to have uh, 45 days notice. And for a 
a provincial election, I think it's 60 days notice for a civic election. I don't see that you need to have a year and a half's notice. So I will be making my mind up uh, next year about that in, in good time uh, to either launch a very strong campaign for re-election uh, or uh, to uh, give other people that want this job the opportunity to do the same. So, uh, but right now we have a city to run and uh, I'm uh, focused on that, not focused on, uh, you know, election, electioneering for 2022. You mentioned Donnie Moore as Ken. Did you get a chance to go to his service yesterday? Yes, I did. Yeah. What did you think of it? You know, I've really only known Don uh, for the last five years in his capacity as president of the uh, Blazers. Uh, but what I heard yesterday was a, a, a story and a legacy about a guy, even when he was working for you guys and, and uh, in a whole bunch of other occupations that had the same qualities and the same attributes that I recognized in, in my tenure of knowing him. So it was very validating for me. And uh, what a strong family, you know, and uh, and uh, certainly the who's who of the hockey community was there. And uh, it was it was a, a fitting uh, send off and, and a great tribute to a great Cam Lucian. Yeah, I agree. I thought the Blazers really hit that out of the park. Uh, Mike Miltimore here also, uh, Lee's Music doing a great job with the audio. Everybody involved did a great job. And if you uh, left that place without shedding a tear, you, you might need some psychological help or you're just not as soft as me. Um, really great service. Ken, thanks a lot for joining us. Is there anything else you wanted to add before we let you go? No, I appreciate the opportunity. I appreciate the coverage and uh, try to make myself as available as I can. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll carry on. Thanks a lot, Ken. Appreciate it. Thanks, Ken. Thank you. Uh, it's like we've been hit again and again and again with, with, with crises, from the opioid overdose mm -hmm. crisis to the pandemic to the wildfire to the smoke to, um, you know, rising house, housing prices, homelessness, uh, addiction, mental health. It's overwhelming, and it can be. And I think you're right when you mention, you know, you got, we got to get off the social media sometimes, uh, me more than most, and, and take a break from it. I've seen, I've talked to some people who have, like, gotten right off it for a week and they say their mental health has never been better and their outlook isn't as bleak as Folds. Well, we're Folds. We're, we're immersed in it. You know, we're yeah. immersed in it. It's like we're seeking punishment by scrolling Twitter. I mean, yeah. and, and and we have to do it. It's part of our job, but it would be nice to, to stop because it's, well, maybe it's not that bad, but it does seem like it's well, that bad. I think we're, we're so immersed in it that it might seem worse than it is. My, my wife often, often says, turn off the news. Let's just, you know what, let's listen to some jazz music and have some wine. And she's got the right idea. It's just not stopping. Anyway, thanks uh, for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Kessa, for joining us as well. Live guest, mm -hmm. Magic Mike, Bonnie. Great job. Again, I want to thank Lee Malbuff for doing this logo for us. Great job, Lee Malbuff. Bad I beef. Bad beef himself, yep. Lee. Uh, the grand ones for the music and New Leaf. New Leaf, our title sponsor for being on board with us. We thank you again. And the verbose Herman. We'll see you last week. Last week.